I'm Don Gray. We're continuing our history of modern art uh, from a painter's viewpoint. I'm an artist and I'm interpreting it as an artist and you'll probably get some different views than you would from an art historian. But we're starting with the Impressionists, uh, with Manet actually, and we're actually into our third program, interrupted briefly by a uh, street painter's program. And we're going to be seeing how the Impressionists, with their basic interest in reality, painting their friends, painting their environment, uh, trips to the seashore, to the parks, to the cabarets, to the restaurants, um, how they paint uh, with a certain zest for life and a reality of subject matter and we're going to see how the 20th century will reject that subject matter and only take from them their technical experimentations their manipulation of paint their use of, of broken color perhaps in the case of uh, Edgar Degas whom we'll see later a sense of, of design of abstract design uh, the and perhaps it will be to the 20th century's loss that we lose the subject matter. And we'll see, uh, we'll start with uh, Monet, his St. Lazare Railroad Station, and talk about the uh, reality of it, the solidity of it, the wonderful sense of atmosphere and place. Of course, Monet is an Impressionist, and his particular bent is to search for the sense of light and the sense of atmosphere, what the, how sunlight and various mists and at different atmospheric conditions affect the reality of a given scene. We're going to trace Monet here so that he gradually dissolves uh, into, into mists. His art dematerializes. We're going to see how that's affected modern art, how Kandinsky saw uh, Monet's fading objects and it fit in with other attributes of his own that he, he reaches a point where he says, hey, listen, uh, why does a painting have to have any subject at all? We're going to reach that point, but I want to make the point right now that Monet was a tremendous realist. And uh, no matter how his work uh, later softened, and, and we'll t try to talk about why it did, but we're showing this picture here to show some of his feeling for the concrete. Okay, we go to the next uh, picture here, and we see Manet, Edouard Manet, the somewhat older artist who was an early inspiration for the Impressionists, his version of the St. Lazare Railroad Station. And, and Manet, always the humanist in a sense, always interested in people, magnifies, as it were, the scene by Monet, bringing us into the lives of what we presume to be a mother and a daughter, a family situation, and a little girl stands at the bars, in a sense, seemingly enclosed from the steam-filled visionary distance. Uh, Man Monet will tend to eliminate the figure in his painting, and uh, we'll see it gradually disappearing. We saw tiny little figures in the station before, and now, at, in the series of haystacks painted in the 1890, objects become the important element, atmosphere, the sense of light in these haystacks. The, this is Monet's epitome of Impressionism. The haystacks at dawn or sunset, presumably dawn, the broken color, the rough surface, trying to emulate and capture the sense of light and how it affects forms. And he's, he's a wonderful painter, a marvelous painter. If we look at another version of the haystacks, he did a series of them exploring the different effects of different atmospheric conditions, different uh, weather conditions. Here there are haystacks in snow, so the picture pales out. It loses its rosy oranges and pinks and uh, wonderful blue-greens and become violets and, and so forth, that kind of thing. Another one of the, his haystacks in the, in the mist, morning mists, uh, the colors become even softer and lighter as the object begins to uh, literally disappear. Now, uh, Monet will do the same thing with a series of cathedrals, and I have a couple of them here. Uh, Rouen Cathedral, where he rents a room across the street from it in the t French town of Rouen, and studies it under different conditions. Here, under the brilliance of sunlight, we there's a certain beautiful reality about the picture. Uh, some people have criticized it that maybe his rough sense of brushwork, his lack of detail, 
uh, loses some of the massiveness that's inherent in cathedrals, but uh, I personally don't feel bothered by it at all. Now let's watch what happens in the next cathedral where he's painted it dissolved by mists and truly we, we literally see uh, almost nothing. You know, the structure on the right, we see some of the turrety uh, uh, carving of the stone perhaps and it disappears almost like a subterranean monster uh, to an extent in the mists of uh, Monet's own psyche. Now, uh, my position is that Monet is not only exploring the effects of light, uh, which are an, a, an outward condition, using the eye, simply looking. And Monet, of course, has been called an eye, uh, but only an eye. Uh, only an eye, but what an eye, you know, in the sense that he just looked at things, but he looked so thoroughly and so well at things that um, he was extraordinary in that aspect. But I, I feel that in these very misty, dreamy, <clears throat> Uh, kind of subterranean pictures. He's speaking about his own inner depths, in a sense. Uh, that he's he's reaching, he's stirring around in the mists and muck and mire of his own inner being, uh, and perhaps the inner being of his age. As the 19, late 19th century moves into, uh, begins to move into the 20th century, a time of unrest and uncertainty. The fact, whenever a, a, a century, one century clicks over into another one, it's it's a moment of extreme psychic tension, you know. And as we near the 21st century, we seem to be getting deeper and deeper into problems and wondering how we're going to solve them, and just a, a, a general atmosphere of stress and anxiety. And I think what we're witnessing is this dematerialization of reality, moving away from reality even though this is real in one sense, he's observing a specific condition, but by misting it over, he is moving uh, away from the world more deeply into himself as all of society does. See, the artist is mirroring, the, mirroring society as a whole moving away from reality. Now this dematerialization will influence uh, Kandinsky, as we said, and we'll get to that in a moment but there are artists who reacted to it. Keep in mind the total nothingness of Monet's picture in terms of form, and we look at this next picture by Paul Cezanne, uh, painted about the same time, in the 1880s actually, Rock re rocky scenery near Aix. Uh, Cezanne's native town in the south of France, and we see Cezanne at the epitome of his powers of building solid form, and Cezanne will be a countercurrent to the dissolving of form. Cezanne, perhaps because his own personal life is troubled and there's a certain amount of inner chaos, which we'll discuss in detail when we get to Cezanne, strives to combat that by paintings of great formal strength. We look at the boulders in the foreground of the rocky ledge there, and they're extremely solid. And Cezanne, uh, Impressionism will be felt to have the weakness of softness. You see, for example, compare, keep in mind the strength of the Cezanne forms, and let's look at a contemporary artist. Uh, Howardina Pindell's untitled painting from 1972. See, obviously connected with uh, Monet very, very closely, but also with the general dematerialization of reality, uh, turning away from the outerness of the world to the innerness of misty visions, uh, to non-objectivity, where the object is eliminated, it's destroyed, it's, it's, it's uh, brutalized or torn apart in many different ways in, in cubism or uh, in here in sort of this misty, what we might call a contemporary neo-impressionism. And this, for example, we'll keep this in mind and look at, at some of the visual strength and definiteness of this picture of my own coming up, you see. Now, if people in a time are used to what Howardina Pindell paints, and suddenly they're struck with something with this intensity and visual acuity and sensitivity to the visual realities of these forms, the solidities of these forms, there's a certain amount of culture shock that uh, is undergone. I mean, people can't deal with the, uh, even though it's my own work, the, the certain, the powerful uh, response to realism that, that I am searching for, and as well as other artists are searching for, as a countercurrent 
to this dematerialization in painting, abstraction in painting, non-objectivization of painting, the removal of oneself from contemporary reality. See? And uh, if we think about it, abstraction per se is, as it denies the real world, uh, can carry one step further. It's, a, it's saying that we deny our own human reality. We deny our own human bodies. We deny our own relationship to the earth. We remove ourselves into an ethereal zone of uh, pure rationality. And uh, pure rationality has been found wanting by many of the great uh, psychologists and thinkers of the 20th century, which we've spoken about before. So if we go back again to Monet's Houses of Parliament, we see this softening of form, a marvelous picture. I'm not saying they aren't wonderful pictures. I think Monet was a great artist, a uh, wonderful sense of atmosphere, but the, <clears throat> the forms are perhaps almost silhouettes as they would be at sunset. See? And he is deliberately selecting subjects at this time that are by nature to a degree dematerialized. If we look at his Monet's Japanese bridge, uh, the, the form is fairly solidly constructed, I think, in this picture. But Monet uh, becomes interested in painting his water lily pond at his home in Giverny. He constructs the pond, builds it to his own specifications, uh, creating almost a fantasy land, a uh, personal garden of Eden where he may retreat, in essence, from the harsher realities of the outside world. This isn't that he doesn't go out and make painting trips to London, as we saw with the Houses of Parliament, but this, this uh, arena of his amongst the flowers and the waters uh, will give him room for his own personal uh, expression of his inner psychic leanings and needs and so forth. And, and water, while, while the water here is perhaps not particularly symbolically handled, water is symbolic of the inner person. You know, the inner uh, unconsciousness of the person. We sink deep into ourselves, deep into the pools of our unconscious in a sense, and it's a fairly obvious uh, uh, symbolical connection. It becomes perhaps more obvious in Monet's paintings of the water lilies where they lose all reference to the surrounding of bridge and land and they become these vast panoramic abstractions. This is at the Museum of Modern Art, three panels, a triptych. Uh, we, we'll look at a detail of one of them because it's very hard to see in the, in the slide of it. And, and we see how two things happen here. The paintings become, uh, again, are somewhat soft and formless and dreamy and, and uh, somewhat elegiac and uh, with this uh, soft uh, contemplative inner quality as we might allow ourselves to sink into these uh, cloudy puffs of paint into the pool. The clouds are reflected in it. We see some of the uh, drawing of the lily pads and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> and secondarily, the way the paint is put on very roughly, almost abstractly. See, and, and people have drawn the, com the link. If we look at the freedom of the application of the paint, people have drawn a link between Monet and Jackson Pollock. Um, in a detail from his painting, Convergence in 1952. Now Pollock is painting here with much more ferocity, uh, which is inherent to his uh, more uh, hard-driving personality, shall we say, a harder, fiercer personality, but one can see this, a certain web-like uh, skeins of colors that suggest, uh, that are formless, in themselves and tie in with Monet's uh, conception of painting to a degree, although obviously with contemporary overtones. In this next picture by Kandinsky, the great Russian abstractionist of the uh, early to middle 20th century, a painting called Church at Murnau, painted in 1909, we see him, Kandinsky, on the verge of becoming totally non-objective. Uh, the picture, in many instances, are some beautiful, wonderful colors, oranges and purples and reds and greens. Uh, it's a wonderful composition. In the upper center is a, what is obviously a chimney, uh, the light yellow side and the orange side, the diagonal shadow cast by and down below the blue side of the building and so forth. But it, it is fading to a degree. See, we move to his uh, painting in 1913, and by this time, in a picture called Painting with White Form, 
uh, he has gone to total non-objectivity. So, and I, w I wouldn't say that Monet is the only influence. Uh, Kandinsky has an innate sense of the spiritual that he is trying to express uh, what he considers the inner reality behind the outer reality of the world that meets our uh, our everyday senses. So that uh, he's, he's making a, a, a genuine attempt to search for deeper realities. And it's significant that he's doing it, that Monet suggested that this was happening at a time when outer realities are becoming increasingly difficult to deal with. The First World War is going to uh, start thundering across Europe uh, in a year and so wars don't just erupt uh, immediately out of nothing, they erupt from the seedbed of long-held discontents, bitternesses, and primitive emotions that are not given outlet anywhere, and finally they break out in a, a, a grand social, uh, grand in an evil sense, social eruption. We can see Kandinsky's influence for carrying this non-objectivity to uh, a, a degree farther in a painting by Arshile Gorky in 1940 called The Garden in Sochi. Uh, some of the forms are even similar. One can see the influence of Miro here, of Picasso, of surrealism generally for those who are in on those terms and, and those art movements, and we'll discuss them in detail as, as they erupt. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, it's, there's no question that uh, uh, what came from Monet, what led to Kandinsky, uh, has spread widely over the art of the 20th century. And in this uh, painting by uh, de Kooning in 1945 called Asheville, we see some similar forms, some similar um, emotional uh, <coughs> organic abstract shapes that stem from Picasso, that stem from Kandinsky, that stem from Moreau. Now I'm not saying that Monet created forms like these in his paintings. Uh, he didn't specifically, although in his some of his late garden paintings he becomes almost an expressionist. Unfortunately I don't have any uh, uh, slides of those where the paint really writhes and tumbles and twists. But I'm saying that a, a general principle of art has been transmitted from one artist of the 19th century, and other artists will be transmitting it too. It's just that Monet is the first one that we're encountering who has done that. And he has said as much in his paintings that uh, maybe subject isn't that important. Maybe we need to go inside ourselves and, and explore some inner fields of awarenesses, and this is exactly what some of these other artists have been doing. <coughs> we see a later uh, de Kooning uh, woman uh, in his, uh, you know, in the 50s, and while obviously there are influences of Van Gogh and the expressionist use of paint, uh, there still is exhibited here the freedom of using paint for its own sake, uh, obliterating the image, if you will. In Jasper John's Out the Window in 1959, there is this sense of non-objectivity, of freeing the artist, if one wants to use that word, from the outer world to what really reaches the point now, frankly, a certain dabbling in the aesthetics of art. You know, art slowly moving away from reality with a certain sense of, of spiritual inner conviction in the work of, of Kandinsky in 1913 into 20s and 30s. Uh, gradually, that tradition of, of uh, excuse me, abstraction and non-objectivity becomes watered down and uh, artists take the outward appearance of non-objectivity, the manipulation of paint, uh, shape, uh, for its own sake without much meaning behind it. And one can see in a painting by Kenneth Nolan in 1966, uh, although it's a geometric abstraction and its more direct air might be the uh, structural work of Cezanne and Cubism in general, still here we see an artist working with color uh, for its own sake, uh, non-objectivity for its own sake, and we could, uh, perhaps without too much strain, trace it back the whole 20th century to uh, Monet and Cezanne, uh, the 19th century forebearers of artists who, uh, Cezanne creating structure and Monet dematerializing the object. So. <clears throat> Back in the 19th century with 
uh, Monet's contemporary Renoir, they were close friends, Pierre Renoir. They painted together. We'll encounter in just a few works of Renoir the same uh, problem that uh, was, if we call it a problem, that was felt in Monet's work. Monet didn't feel it was a problem, the softening of the forms, the dissolving into mists, but other artists like Cezanne and Renoir in a moment will exhibit that feeling. However, early in his career, Renoir is a satisfied uh, uh, impressionist. In a picture called The Swing, he paints a typical um, a gentle scene of, of people seemingly without problems enjoying each other in the dappled sunlight of wonderful nature. His people often seem to exist as if in a Garden of Eden uh, before the serpent uh, passes on the apple. You know, I mean, this could be Eve, and instead of a serpent, there's a little child on the lower left looking almost like an angel, you know, with what looks like a golden halo, although presumably uh, is some kind of a, a hat. But uh, uh, Renoir is profound enough an artist to, if not consciously, suggest some of these things. Uncon these things come directly from the unconscious of the artist, and I, it's not far-fetched in my mind to speak of things uh, of this sort. In another picture, a, a famous early masterpiece, the Moulin de la Galette, the mill of the, uh, a certain kind of cake, I guess it was, uh, Galette, a mill of the cake or the cake mill, Seems a little strange translation. I'm probably doing a vile job of it, but nonetheless, both pictures painted in uh, 1876. We see again a certain uh, enjoyment-loving humanity, uh, seemingly without troubles, without strained nerves, without stress, uh, tension, or or suffering of any kind, enjoying each other in amiable friendship, love, and, and comradeship in the dappled, again, we see some of the backs of the people in the foreground, some of their faces dappled by the wonderful, beneficent light of nature that filters through the wonderful foliage of nature. It's, again, it, it has the idea of a Garden of Eden. Next time we'll look at Lautrec's, we're not about to close yet, but um, <laughs> next program we'll look at Toulouse-Lautrec's at the Moulin Rouge, and, and keep in mind the wholesomeness of this picture, maybe we'll show it again, and the sense of, of, of livid, underground, bohemian, uh, sweltering uh, cafe life where people are tormented and suffer like Van Gogh's Night Cafe, as he says, where a man can go mad or commit a crime. There's none of this in Renoir. It's, this, is, uh, this is the 19th century, in a sense, before 20th century tensions invade it. We go to another uh, wonderful early picture of Renoir, painted about this time, 1878, Portrait of Madame Henriot, uh, which I have always thought was a lovely picture and the epitome of, of femininity in a, in, a, in a delicate, lush, wonderful sense. Uh, uh, we're drawn to the head, obviously, because of those snapping dark eyes and the dark uh, reddish-brown hair that sets off the standout from the general pale, pinky, tanny, uh, uh, fleshy tones of the entire picture. Uh, and it's a wonderful picture. It's, it's a masterpiece of intimate uh, portraiture and the expression of a feminine uh, principle as well as a, a beautiful uh, particular woman. But it is not a great statement of form. Uh, we look at the softness of the way the body is handled. The body seems to almost float and melt into the lightness of the equal lightness of the background. Renoir, at the age of about 40 or 41, will begin to question these wonderful early pictures, the softness of the form that he has uh, fallen into as, natural, as a natural exponent of Impressionism. Where Monet won't question it, it will bother Renoir deeply. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that at this time, at a natural transition point in a man or woman's life, what might be called the midlife change or the midlife crisis, uh, it translates into Renoir's life, uh, into his art, where he questions himself and he, he begins to say, do I want to spend the rest of my life painting pictures like this? Uh, you know, natural thoughts enter a person's mind. Here I am, closer to the end of my life than the beginning. I'd really better get down to business. You know, <laughs> whatever your business is going to be that a younger person may not think of. So that what happens is... Uh, Pictures like the one following. Keep in mind the softness of Madame Henriot as we go to a, a bather 
painted at about the transition line of 1880-1881. Notice the hardening of the contours, the sharpening of the contours as Renoir who says that he has forgotten how to draw and that there's something too soft and non-structural in Impressionism goes to Italy to study the frescoes of Raphael and, and other great Italian Renaissance painters and he comes back with a new dedication to firming up his contours and he will harden them for a time. It will be called his harsh period. Uh, and then he will relax to a degree uh, while maintaining some of a sense of form and structure that he attained in his uh, bather there. We see a woman with a guitar and uh, while the contours are firm, they are not razor-like as they were in the guitar. The picture's a little hazy, but we'll, won't stay with it long so that we'll, um, won't bother us too much. But there's a certain grandeur, a certain uh, grandness of volume in a sense. This sense of, of wonderful volume will continue into his very late period in 1897 and on to his death in the late teens of the 20th century where his figures become wonderful symbols of the feminine principle, if one would say. These, these figures are almost like massive earth goddesses whose bodies get bigger the closer they are to the earth. Their feet are huge, their thighs and their stomachs, and they gradually grow smaller toward the top of the body. And if you go to the Museum of Modern Art, you'll see a painting of two figures there by Renoir, where his colors become more flame-like, more uh, freely brushed, and it's not just because he's suffering from arthritis, but in his old age he's reaching a more spiritual fulfillment. Uh, he's loosening up, he's freeing up, and his inner soul is flowing directly into these grand symbolic paintings. But in conclusion, uh, Renoir fights against this dematerialization of the object. And most of the Impressionists were these great realists. Monet was a great realist, and they respected life and the substance of form and the life around them. And the 20th century takes very little of that from the Impressionists. And we'll continue this discussion in our next program. I'm Don Gray, the program's artist and critic. Thanks very much for being with me.